Welcome to episode 297 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired assistant director of the FBI's Victim Services Division, Catherine Terman. Catherine served in the FBI for 20 years. In this episode, she reviews the origins of the Victim Services Division, the Victim Services Specialist position, and the major cases and crisis events her staff deployed to providing assistance and support to victims around the world. Catherine was in charge of the Victim Services Division from 2002 to 2020. Selected for the position by FBI Director Robert Mueller, she developed and led the FBI's response to 9-11 victims, victims of more than 100 acts of terrorism overseas, and to more than 35 terrorism and mass violence events across the U.S. Beginning with six employees, the FBI's Victim Services Division is now comprised of almost 300 victim specialists, terrorism victim service coordinators, child and adolescent forensic interviewers, child victim service specialists, an international hostage family engagement team, and operational psychologist. During her bureau career, Catherine established a victim services team that has become an international model. Prior to joining the FBI, Catherine served in the Department of Justice as director of the Missing and Exploited Children's Program, chief of the Victim Witness Assistance Unit in the United States Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia, and director of the Office for Victims of Crime, OVC. Catherine began her public service career as an aide to the late Senator John Hines. She has received the Edmund J. Randolph Award, the highest honor provided by DOJ for her work with Pan Am 103 Lockerbie Families. She received the Attorney General's Award for Distinguished Service, two National Crime Victim Service Awards, two National Intelligence Meritorious Citations, and is one of the few federal employees to receive Presidential Rank Awards for both Meritorious and Distinguished Service. Now retired and living in the Nashville area, Catherine volunteers as a court-appointed special advocate for abused and neglected children. I can't wait for you to listen to this episode. The work of victim service specialists have been mentioned several times during other case reviews, so I'm excited to take a deeper look at how victims are assisted and supported by the FBI. If you're listening to this episode when it first comes out and you're in Orlando at CrimeCon this weekend, please stop by Podcast Road to say hello. I would love to meet you in person. I have lots of podcast swag, stickers, buttons, and bookmarks to give away. I'll write all about CrimeCon in my October Reader Team email, where I will also officially identify the FBI official I interviewed for the 300th episode of FBI Retired Case File Review to be released on November 1st. He will speak with authority about today's FBI. Now, if you already know or think you know who it is, shh, let's keep building up the suspense until next month. Don't forget, I'm traveling to Brazil and Argentina in October. So if you live in Rio or Buenos Aires and want to meet up with me, email me and let's see if we can make that happen. In your podcast app's description of this episode, you'll find links to where you can join my reader team, which is all about the FBI and books, TV and movies. Buy me a cup of coffee and learn more about me and my books. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, retired assistant director of the FBI's Victim Services Division, Catherine Terman. Hey, Catherine, how are you? I'm good, Jerry. How are you? I am doing great. I am so excited about having you on the show today. 
because I plan to release this the day before I attend CrimeCon, which is an international convention in Florida this year of people who really care about victims, especially when it comes to the missing and murdered and how they are treated and served by law enforcement and respected by advocates of true crime. This is perfect timing for you to be here today. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. What I want to do, and I've already read your bio so people have an idea of who you are and why I'm so excited to have you here, but I will also link to other articles that came out when you retired that talk a lot about your background. So because of that, I want to get right into your work with the FBI and how that all started. Could you take us from the beginning and then we'll get right into exactly what a victim specialist does in the FBI and actually show everyone what you do, showing people the kind of services that are provided. Where do you want to start? I keep talking. Where do you want to start? My road to the FBI started really when I moved to Washington and was working for a U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania, John Hines. And I'd been there a couple of years when the bombing of Pan Am 103 occurred. So the senator had been very active on the president's task force on victims of crime. He continued to be as a senator. And he actually knew, the office knew through our work, several of the victims or family members of victims on Pan Am 103. So when that occurred on December 21st, 1988, That became the beginning of my connection with this case, which would weave throughout my career in the Justice Department and the FBI, intersecting with Director Robert Mueller along the way, and ultimately leading to how we ended up fashioning the Victim Services Division in the FBI. Until September 11th, 2001, the bombing of Pan Am 103 remained one of the deadliest terror attacks in the world. I met families in the immediate aftermath while working for the senator. The families were on the Hill demanding more action on preventing terrorism, improving aviation security, and seeking justice for their loved ones. When Pan Am 103 happened, there was nothing in place in the U.S. government to help families, even our own U.S. citizens. There was nothing. The families believed that somewhere in the massive U.S. government, there was some office or some phone number that they could call where they could get help. And that just wasn't the case. The State Department did a little bit. There were FBI agents who interviewed families and some who stayed in touch with some of the families and tried to answer their questions, but there was no organized plan for keeping them informed or assisting them. I left Capitol Hill in 1991 when Senator Hines himself was killed in a plane crash in Philadelphia. So from there, I went to the Justice Department where I had three different positions. The first one, I was director of the Missing Exploited Children's Program, where I helped develop and funded and managed programs with their families, dealt with kids who were abducted, exploited, everything from stranger abductions of kids to international parental kidnapping and human trafficking of kids. While I was there, I met Director Mueller, who was the assistant attorney general for the criminal division in the Justice Department. And he was very engaged in the Pan Am 103 case, working with the agents, working with the Scots. It was a case that he has talked about many times as being something that made a very large impression on him. He was the person who announced the U.S. indictment of the two Libyans. Anybody who's interested in learning more about that investigation, I did do a case review with Richard Marquise. It was episode 47. I will put a link to it in the show notes for this episode. Dick Marquise and I have been friends for a long time. I met him when I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. He was still involved in Pan Am 103. His book, Scott Bomb, is a very good depiction of the investigation. When I was in the Justice Department at the U.S. Attorney's Office, this was the office that oversaw the U.S. government's policy and programming for victims of crime. It also administers the Federal Crime Victims Fund, which is this wonderful pot of money that's paid by federal offenders, assessment, special fees, fines, and those monies go to support victims' compensation and crime victims' assistance programs all around the United States. The FBI, U.S. Attorney's Office, and some other federal agencies also get a cut of that because we are the agencies that bring in those funds. While I was there, we worked on Columbine, the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing, Cobar Towers, U.S. Embassy bombings, and ultimately the USS Cole. A lot of times when you hear the word victim, you think about the person that was directly affected by the crime. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and so under federal law, a victim is anyone who suffers direct emotional, physical, or psychological harm as the result of the commission of a federal offense. Families of victims, particularly those who die in horrific and tragic ways, every family looks for justice. Every family looks for information. One of the things I've learned over 33 years of working with victims, and particularly families of homicide or terrorism victims, is that they're going to imagine what happened to their loved one. They're going to think about it. They're going to ruminate on it. They're going to want to know what happened. And sometimes what they imagine is worse. What they imagine may be better. I don't know. But at the end of the day, they can deal with and come to terms with what they know to be true. They just want to know who was behind it, why they did it, how it happened, and then to hold somebody accountable for it. The Scots, their legal system has a motto that says justice must be seen to be done. And that's especially true for victims and families. They need to see the inner workings. They need to see how justice, the wheels of justice roll. Sometimes the outcome's not exactly what they want or it's not full justice, but it's important that they have the ability to see the process and to participate when possible. It's just another step, important step, in their ability to move forward after a terrible crime. So this is the case and the work that you were doing that got you on the radar when Director Mueller took over the FBI mm-hmm. right after 9-11 and looked around and said, we got a lot of victims here, mm-hmm. but no victim services. Right. Director Mueller, during the Pan Am 103 trial, the Scotts trial, he was the U.S. attorney in the Northern District of California. Before that, he had been chief of homicide at the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office, and I was chief of victim assistance. So our paths crossed a lot there, too. And then when 9-11 happened, my office, the Office for Victims of Crime and Justice, had been, after all the different terrorist attacks and mass shootings, had been working on trying to put together an infrastructure, along with the NTSB and other agencies, on what should be done by the federal government after a mass casualty, whether it's an accident, it's a crime, it's a natural disaster, can we make it consistent? We were working on those kinds of plans when 9-11 happened, and one of my colleagues and I went to the SIOC that night about 10 o'clock. I was there helping to set up the victim assistant sort of room, an offshoot in SIOC, where we could talk about those issues. One of the things I helped do that night was to try to get the victim list, the manifest, at least from the flights, released so that the NTSB could also have a copy of it. The FBI had them. While I was there in SIOC that night, I saw Director Mueller, and he came up and said, tell us what we need to do for these victims. And I was aware that the FBI had sort of a minimal program. It was paired with community outreach. Then it was paired with asset forfeiture, which kind of made less sense. It was mainly some well-intentioned small group of employees, but only one had any victim assistance experience, and they had a lot of different things going on. When 9-11 happened, no federal agency was prepared at the time for something that massive. Three impact sites, four planes, military installation, unknown number of people at the World Trade Center. It was chaotic. It was crazy. Everybody was doing their thing. The military was doing their thing with the Pentagon. The FBI was involved in all sites, including, of course, Pennsylvania, Shanksville, and also in New York. But it took time for all of that chaos to sort of resolve Even looking back, it could have been much better coordinated, particularly from the federal level, because it was a federal crime and someone needed to coordinate across jurisdictions to make sure that everybody, regardless of whether they were in the World Trade Center, they were on a plane, they were in the Pentagon, got the same rights and information and assistance. Those were some of the lessons we learned. I saw Director Mueller a couple of times after that, and then I heard that he was had asked for a a study or something to be done, a a review of the FBI's victim assistance capacity. I was still busy at OVC. And then in December, right before Christmas, I got a call from him saying, I'm putting together this office for in a new program on victim assistance. Will you come over and run it? And I said, do I have a choice? And he said, not really. So I had, by the time I got back from Christmas holidays, he had engineered my transfer from the Justice Department over to the FBI to start this program. I asked him when I got there, I think it was my first day on the job, I said, what do you expect? What, what do you want from, from me and, and from this effort? And he said, I want a professional victim assistance program. I want victim advocates like we had at the U.S. Attorney's Office. This was the, the office that did local crime as well as federal crime. So we had domestic violence advocates, child interview specialists, all kinds of things that weren't typical in a federal office generally. So that was the start. We had a great deal of support from him at the beginning, which helped. 
it was a chaotic timing. The Bureau was under the gun from 9-11, just people working flat out, hours and hours, weekends. There was so much going on. But he managed to help keep a focus on what was known then as the Office for Victim Assistance and provided a lot of support. One of my jobs was to start hiring people. So we were able to set aside on the Federal Crime Victims Fund for 112 victim specialist positions in the FBI. It took time to find those people, hire them, get them through background, get them on board. There were two forensic child interview specialists in my old office. So Mueller said, take them to your office, take them from where they are and put them in your office. So that helped. We began hiring people and started, I started calling around, talking to agents I knew, getting names and phone numbers of other agents and asking them, what do you think you need? What would help with victims in your cases? What are you seeing? What's not here that would be helpful? I looked at the law. I looked at the attorney general guidelines, brought in people, and we worked on putting together the structure of what the program should do and what it should look like with input from all of those folks. And we wrote policies. Like I said, we started hiring people and getting them on board and putting them out in the field offices. At the same time, it was like the proverbial building a plane while you're flying it. We had all of this stuff going on with 9-11 families. And we had a very small office. It was myself. There was an agent that was TDY'd and four other people, plus the two child interviewers who were interviewing kids in cases all over the country. I was able to hire, take some of those 112 positions and hire a couple of clinical social workers from Walter Reed Army Hospital who had worked with amputees and with PTSD victims, urgent care, and they were wonderful. We were dealing by that time with civilian casualties coming from Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan. We had terrorist cases in Yemen and Bali. And we were responsible for reaching out to families and survivors of those victims, sometimes of coordinating the repatriation of those remains of those victims to Dover Air Force Base for autopsy. We worked with families on disposition of the victims from that point, how they were going to get home. We used our emergency funds to pay for transporting victims' remains. We reached out to the families, tried to provide services for them in the local area. If they lived where there was an FBI victim specialist, we linked them up so they could have access to someone close by. That took a lot, just working on those issues. We were seeing with the terrorism cases coming in and the overseas terrorism casualties from Iraq and Middle East and other parts of the world. We were building the plane as we were flying it. We were having to deal with all of these new cases, 9-11, terrorism cases from overseas, hostage cases, and at the same time, trying to build a capacity across the FBI. Most of the FBI's, the bread and butter crimes are in the field offices. Most of the victim cases are in the field offices. We wanted to have the right people in those positions. Director Mueller made sure I had opportunities to talk at SAC conferences. And there were some people, some agents who were, embraced the program, who got it, who understood why it was helpful and important and were open to it. And we had a few others who were not quite, had to be convinced. What were their problems? I don't know. I had a couple of people tell me. One SAC came up and said, this is just a boondoggle. I don't see why we need this. It's not the FBI's job to hug people. We arrest bad guys. And I said, okay, but we still have victims and we have legal requirements. And if we have a victim who is being taken care of, you're going to be better off as an agent. They're not going to be calling you, bothering you all the time. And they're going to be in a better position to be able to cooperate and to participate in the case. I would imagine that many of those that were calling victims were also witnesses. Yes. And so if you can make your witness comfortable and feel that you have empathy to what they're going through, I think they would make better witnesses. Absolutely. We didn't want to get into the idea of, and I've heard people do this before, that your victims are your best evidence. They're more than that. They're more than evidence. They are important witnesses in many cases, but they're more than that. It's important for us to remember that for investigative agencies, prosecutors, we're always going to move on to the next case. The victims or the victim's families are the ones that are going to have to live with this for the rest of their lives. And how they're treated by the agencies that interact with them, particularly the first ones that are a part of the response, is going to determine how they feel about the Justice Department, how they feel about the agency that's investigating, how they feel about the prosecutors. It just makes everything work better if we recognize that the victims have needs, they have an interest that goes way beyond ours, and just try to make sure that they get what they need and that they're treated with dignity and respect and that we keep them informed. 
That's one of the things victims complain the most about or have complained the most about investigators and prosecutors is not being informed. Information is really important to them. They want to know what happened, who was behind it, what's going on, what do I need to do, what are you doing to the extent that investigators can tell them. That relationship can be very important. We started looking for victim specialists in the field. We changed our requirements. Early on, the field office was sort of managing the hiring, and they weren't always getting the right people. They were promoting some people who weren't qualified. It's very difficult. You can't just be nice. It's not enough to just be nice. You need someone who understands trauma, who understands the dynamics of victimization, who understands the types of support systems that might be available for victims in their communities, from emergency housing to mental health care, things like that. And you need somebody who is trained enough to be able to assess an individual victim or a family and what are their issues, what's going on, what are their strengths, what do they need, what can we provide, what can we refer them out to. Those things are really important to be able to do this job well. It's also not fair to take someone who isn't trained, isn't experienced in working with traumatized individuals and throw them into that job. We had some who were extremely traumatized by even dealing with the victim or even hearing what happened to them. So that didn't help very much. I talked to one person who had the job. She had been promoted. Nice lady, but she didn't really understand the job. And she had actually missed an agent who had called her and written her and said, I'm concerned about this victim. I think he's suicidal. And she didn't know what to do and waited. And eventually the victim committed suicide. There's also a liability for the FBI and other agencies if they don't do the right thing for people, particularly in that kind of a situation. We revised the positions a little bit. It was very controversial, but it was the right thing to do in the end because we got really good people who had the right qualifications, people who had at least a bachelor's degree in social and behavioral science. They had two or three years experience working with victims of crime. We took them from a lot of different agencies, including some child protective services workers who had worked with child abuse victims, domestic violence advocates, people who had worked with victims in prosecutors' offices. We began developing that sort of diverse cadre of victim specialists. Coming into the FBI from the outside, particularly as a social services type person, can be pretty daunting. Some people are very welcoming and get it, and then there are others that just don't. One of the things I used to tell the victim specialists is I said, you just have to win agents over one at a time. You're not going to get all of them. It's up to you to prove that what you can do to support the victims in their cases and to help them will actually help them and help their cases as well. The most important thing an agent wants to know is that you're not going to mess up their case. So we trained the victim specialists, even if they came with all kinds of experience. We brought them to headquarters for a few weeks. We made sure they had training on the FBI on how things work in the FBI, the legal issues, all those kinds of things. We also were hiring more forensic child interviewers. These are people who tend to have master's degrees. A lot of them are clinical social workers. They are not only experts in trauma, but child trauma, child development, and language development in kids. It's really important when interviewing children about a crime to understand the verbal abilities, the cognitive abilities of these kids, how they understand what's happened to them. And also just to assess, is this child functioning at a a level that's appropriate for their age or are they behind? Are they a 10-year-old really functioning at a level of a 5- or 6-year-old? And most agents aren't equipped to do that. Most people aren't. The child interviewers would do those kinds of assessments, still do, and then tailor their interview protocol and the language they use to the child in their particular developmental level and the level of trauma that they have. That seems like almost two different jobs. Mm -hmm. Is there like a category or a list of people who would work under victim services? Yeah, as time went on with our program as it grew, we started with the victim specialists, which were the bread and butter VSs out in the field who handle any type of victim crime that came into the office. And then we had forensic child interviewers who initially, we had a couple that were based at headquarters, and then we started hiring more, a few at a time, and putting them around the country, particularly Indian country. We had those folks. I think now, if I remember correctly, they're up to, I think, almost 30 child interviewers in the Victim Services Division. And as VSD has grown, there are a number of different units. There's a section chief. It's grown quite a bit. So there's a pretty robust headquarters component that supports the work in the field. There are program managers that help support the victim specialists in the field. There's a child victims unit. There's a terrorism and special jurisdiction unit. 
it's grown over time to sort of meet the needs of the victims in FBI cases and the capacity that's needed. When you look at the list of jobs under the Victim Services Division, it's victim specialists, it's the child interviewers, it's program management analysts, they're operational psychologists who particularly work with hostage victims and with recovery and reintegration of hostages back into normal life. A lot of folks have a different sort of focus. The ones particularly based at headquarters, the victim specialists in the field, as I said, are much more generalized. It's all hard jobs, but they're on call a lot. They do a lot of windshield time, particularly out in Indian country. They have to drive long distances to get to where the victims are. As it's grown, there's a number we have. I think there's a position we had at one time, and I think they've rehired someone for it. It's a disaster family assistance specialist, and it's someone who actually has a sort of a medical legal investigation background who can interface with medical examiners and coroners between them and families and then advise families and and help them understand autopsy reports, things like that. And in mass casualty cases, that person then becomes a pretty valuable liaison to the local medical examiner and coroner. How many of those does the FBI I think there's have? only one in VSD of that because they deal primarily on the mass casualty side and then the terrorism stuff. For the most part, the vast majority of the positions are, are field office victim specialists and then child victim specialists, child interviewers, and program managers. There's a financial unit, administrative support, all the things that you need to keep a program like that moving. The funding for the program, I have no idea. I've lost touch. I have gotten so much funding from the Federal Crime Victims Fund. I know it's three or four hundred million dollars or more over the last 20 something years. So the program's primarily funded by that, that money, not by FBI funds, although the FBI has to kick in some. There's some concern that the Federal Crime Victims Fund, the collections have been dropping in recent years as the Justice Department seems to have been prosecuting fewer white collar criminals or getting big fines from them. Most of that money, as I said, goes to the states to support everything from domestic violence shelters, child advocacy centers, homicide support groups, to supplement crime victims' compensation programs. Only a small portion of it goes to the federal agencies. But it's important. It's really important. And I'm hoping that the collections in the Crime Victims Fund will start to climb again because it puts a lot of programs at jeopardy. A lot of states have had to close down programs because their funding has dried up. I came into the Bureau in 1982. Mm -hmm. This was way mm-hmm. before you came on board and started to grow the program. And I remember victim services really being someone in the office that can help transport your victim witness mm-hmm. to court. That's one of their main jobs to do is help you with that coordination mm-hmm. when you had a trial going right. on. So definitely the program has expanded. Can we talk a little bit now about actual cases that people know about, they've heard about, and break down what a victim specialist would do in those situations? Indian country, particularly, a victim specialist might be called out to a child abuse crime, a homicide. I remember a a victim specialist, one of our very experienced ones in Indian country, getting called to a case where there had been a homicide of a child and of another adult. There were two agents there and her, and she worked, supported the family, the other children. She was also asked at the end to sort of help them finish bagging up one of the victim's bodies. You never knew what you were going to get, I think, in Indian country. There was another case, I remember from Indian country, where a child had been badly beaten and medevaced from the reservation to a children's hospital. So the victim specialist called us. We arranged to transport the family members, non-offending family members, to that children's hospital, put them up in a hotel while they could be there. Ultimately, they had to make the decision to take the child off life support. So we brought in some additional family members because how Native Americans define their family is a little bit larger than most of us do. You recognize what is family to them. So the victim specialist was there with them all of those days with them when they made that terrible decision and then called us so that we could make arrangements to ship that child's remains home and get the family back home. It could be anything like that. Child kidnapping cases become very intensive work for victim specialists, for the agents, of course, involved as well. The victim specialists will connect with the family, will be there for them to help support them, help keep them informed. 
we'll sometimes just, particularly if the case goes on for a long time, sit with them, check in on them, get them resources, and basically just be there. And if there's good news, they'll help us organize and support for the recovery of that child and the services that the child and family may need. If the child is deceased, then often the victim specialist will be a part of that death notification team because that person knows knows the family and has been there with them and understands, you know, how this is going to affect them. There are a number of child kidnapping. Most people remember the J.C. Dugard case. This was a, a young girl that had gone missing. I think she was 11. She was found many years later as an adult living as a prisoner of her perpetrator. She had had two children by him, and she was miraculous. She was still there and and was recovered, working with local victim advocates. Our victim specialists were there with her. Together, they were able to find a private home where a property where they could go to get away from the media and where they could start to receive some assistance and services and be reunited with family. We brought in a colleague, not from the FBI, but a, a child psychologist with special expertise in child abduction, trauma, to help as well to do some assessment and then to advise a local therapist who would be working with the the victim, with JC and her children. There were a lot of services that went into that. I'll never forget, we had another kidnapping case out of California involved a young teenager who was abducted by a family friend of her father's. Her parents were divorced. He'd been around the family. He was enamored of her. This was like a teenager, young girl. He ended up murdering her mother and eight-year-old brother and kidnapped the girl and went on the run with her. They ended up in the mountains somewhere in another state. There was a massive manhunt. I was in my office when I got a call saying that they think they had spotted them. There had been some people on a trail ride who spotted a man basically with a young girl wearing pajama pants, and there was a cat following him up in the mountains where they shouldn't have been. So the FBI got air surveillance. They were able to locate the girl with their abductor. While they were planning, they got hostage rescue out there to rescue her. We were back at headquarters making plans, so we we started moving victim specialists into place, one at the bottom of the mountain where she would come first, and that victim specialist found the nearest hospital, a small hospital, made arrangements there for the girl to go there first to be medically examined. We had another victim specialist who was at a hospital in the next largest town making arrangements for her to enter the hospital privately, to have a private room, to get the services, including a rape exam, other things that she needed. We also flew in a child, one of our forensic child interview specialists to do the interview with her. By the time the HRT folks came in, they were able to, with a clean shot, kill the abductor, rescue the girl, get her down the mountain. She was quickly taken to the hospital where she received the initial exam and some hydration. And actually, she had brought her cat along, so we had the cat, too. The cat was part of all of this, which wasn't really talked about very much, but the cat was important to the victim. Then she was medevaced to the hospital where that other victim specialist was ready for her and had organized with the hospital for her to be brought in a private entrance in the back because there was all this media already gathering in front of the hospital and to get into a room, get her exams, get cleaned up, get some medical treatment. And then the victim specialist and an agent and the child interview specialist had to tell her that her mother and brother, her younger brother, had been murdered. So they had to do that part. We organized working with them, her father to travel in and see her. And then we were trying to figure out how to get them back home without having to put this kid, this traumatized kid, on a commercial aircraft. It was a Sunday. I talked to the deputy director. He agreed to approach DOJ, see if we could use an FBI plane to fly her and her father and her cat back to California. And they agreed, and we were able to do that. She was met by a victim specialist in her hometown who then became her point of contact for mental health services, helped her reunite with her grandmother, and just basically stayed in touch with her for a while. One of the funny things that came up about this later was I got a call from the aviation folks down at Quantico who said, we have a problem. We know the name of the girl, her father, because we have to turn in every time we fly an FBI plane, particularly when we take civilians, we have to file a report. And he said, so what do we do about the cat? said, well, Kat's name is Oliver. So just put him down as Oliver with the last name. So that's what they did. Let me catch up. How was the brother and mother killed? The the perpetrator tortured the mother and the eight-year-old and then murdered them and set fire to the house. 
It was a very brutal murder. It was a lot for this young girl had gone through so much already and then have to deal with the fact that her mother and brother had died and died terribly. I know the victim specialist who worked with her stayed in touch with her for a long time. The last I heard, I understand that she's doing pretty well, given all of the terrible things that happened to her. So not every FBI case is that intense, but there are many like that. The Ethan Gilman case, the little boy that was abducted by a school bus driver and put in a bunker. Again, there was sort of a dynamic rescue, and then we had people lined up, victim specialists, child interview specialists, hospital, medical experts, everything to sort of handle his care as soon as he was recovered. I think that's the most important thing to understand, whether it's a major case like that that gets a lot of attention, or it's just one of the daily cases that victim specialists deal with, is that it takes a team. And we've had some wonderful agents that were on our special agent our special agent steering committee for the Victim Services Division. And they used to talk about the need for agents to partner with their victim specialists. And one of the best days I had in the FBI was when I had an agent who had been a skeptic early on who told me that he said he would no more think of going out to a scene with victims alone without his victim specialist. He would not taking an ERT person. It just became part of the work, part of the program to have that victim specialist there to perform their role. Whether it's a takedown, maybe they're going to arrest a child pornography subject and their children in the home. When the agents go in, the victim specialist and maybe child protective services are around the corner waiting. And once the scene's clear, then they come in and they will deal with the children and make sure they have a safe place to go and that they're comforted and the right family members are contacted to step in and help. That's been really gratifying to see how embedded the victim services program has become. It will never be the main mission of the FBI, but it's a really important part of it. It's part of the team. And it's really important. And I think it becomes even more important when you see said really major cases or like a mass casualty crime where the needs of victims and families are so overwhelming. And the people who are responding to those events from a law enforcement perspective, they've got enough to deal with. There's so many victims, so many families. So the role of the victim specialist and the VSD's victim services response team for mass casualties become a really critical part of the process. I can imagine so, because going out on arrest and searches, there were many times when there were children and family members around and somebody on the arrest team, one of the agents, that would be their role to talk to them and assure them and Mm -hmm. to keep them out of the way during the work that needed to be done at their particular location. That work always needed somebody designated to do it. It used to be an agent. And now to have somebody that's actually trained and experienced in doing that type of work. And connected because there is no federal child protection system. The federal agencies like the FBI can't take a child who's not a subject into custody. The victim specialists will know if there's a family member that is acceptable that they can hand the child over to, or they will coordinate with local child protective services so that they can then do the vetting of who the child's going to go to, whether they're going to go into foster care, or whether there is a family member or family members that can take them. And it's not just that, it's also providing some comfort for that child, trying to normalize things as quickly as possible for them after being a part of something like that. Those are the type of cases we think about. Can you give an example maybe of like a drug enterprise type case where victim services might go into? Yeah, there are. And I know our colleagues in DEA deal with this too. There've been a number of takedowns or interdictions that the FBI's done in drug cases. And often, particularly if it's in a home, there will often be children there. And sometimes the conditions are horrific. It's not a safe place for kids for a lot of reasons. So the victim specialists become a really important part of that, particularly if you've, like I said, if you've got kids there, they may be malnourished. They may have been exposed to drugs. They may not have enough food in the house. They may be filthy. The house may be not habitable. Making sure that those kids get what they need, get help right away, get into the right hands. Our victim specialists, the FBI does provide cars for them. If you look in the trunk of their car in the back seat, you'll see a baby car seat, sometimes two, diapers, some emergency clothing, some baby food, sometimes whatever they need, because they may have to immediately help a victim or a child with things. They may have to transport a child, so they need the car seat. 
frequently the victim specialists will call and request. Sometimes there'll be a kidnapped victim who's recovered. The clothing needs to be taken for evidence. The FBI victim specialists will make sure that that victim has clean clothing to change into, whether it's sweatpants and a t-shirt and some flip-flops and socks or a jacket or whatever. The Victim Services Division will pay for that with the Federal Emergency Victim Assistance Funds. This happens a lot with human trafficking cases as well, whether it's a labor trafficking or sex trafficking case. I've seen, we had cases where the FBI would go into locations where where victims were being prostituted and have to take the victims and the perpetrators out. And we'd have to arrange, if there were a number of them, a safe place for them to go for medical providers, for medications if they need those, and certainly for appropriate clothing. Those are sort of the things that you don't always think about, and we sort of learned on the fly that we needed to have in place for those those kinds of cases. Let's talk a little now about the response to mass shootings and mass crises. I would imagine that it's not just one victim service specialist that are going out to those type of No. The sad thing is that they've become so commonplace now. Used to, not that many years ago, a mass shooting was a fairly rare event. Now it's not. There are so many that it's taxed responders, particularly those like the Red Cross, the FBI, others who are nationally sort of scoped in terms of their ability to respond. In the smaller cases, three or four victims, you may have local victim specialists from the FBI who will support their local partners. We always look at it from the point of view, is this a locally led case or is this a federal case that the FBI has the lead on? Regardless, particularly thanks to the Investigative Assistance Act of, that's not the right title, of 2012, it was passed after Sandy Hook that allows a local jurisdiction to request federal assets like from the FBI, ERT, agents, and victim services to come in and support their response. A mass casualty, particularly in a smaller jurisdiction, will overwhelm their resources very quickly. A lot of communities just aren't resourced for it. There's only about 30%, 34% of law enforcement agencies in the United States have victim services embedded with them. And they're the ones who have the initial contacts with victims. And there are certain things that nonprofit groups, local nonprofit victim service agencies can do, but there are some things that really are the responsibility of the law enforcement agency And they have to intersect with victims and victims' families on some of those tasks. So it's really important to have the right support there to make sure that goes smoothly. We started this, like I said, with the FBI. When we first, I first got there, we were doing 9-11. We were doing overseas terrorism cases, things like that. And then we started having some of the shootings. One of the ones that was a pivotal point for us was the shooting on the Red Lake Reservation. A number of our Indian country victim specialists went there to help, but they didn't have a real clear direction of what to do and what they could do and what was needed. Very smartly on their part, they came back and sent us a report saying, this is what we did. This is what we saw. This is what we think would be helpful. This is what we think the needs are. Over about a year period, we started putting together the idea of a victim assistance response team for mass casualties and also for things like major human trafficking takedowns. The mass casualty stuff became pretty quickly the focus. Our first effort at that, we surveyed. We got applications from victim specialists. We had a team of about 21 or 22 victim specialists with some of the VSD staff. They began responding to things. Virginia Tech, which was a challenge because the first call I got was from Dr. Marcello Fierro, who was the state medical examiner for Virginia. And she called me and I'd seen on CNN TV in my office, there has been a shooting at Virginia Tech. There may be about 10 victims. When Dr. Fierro called me from her car phone, she said, we need your folks down here in Blacksburg. And I said, yeah, I just heard about that. What do you need? And she said, well, there's over 30 deceased, which was not on the news at that point. So we began sort of organizing a team. So she wanted our help with her pathologist in terms of interfacing with families, doing death notification, helping to collect anti-mortem records that might help in victim identification. We also got a request from the attorney general to go. So we told them that we were already sending people. The state police asked for our help. And then the administration of the college ended up asking for help. Our folks did a lot of different things, helped set up a family assistance center, helped with personal effects, helped the medical examiner's office. And then when the students were allowed back into Norris Hall, our folks and some Red Cross folks were there to help them as they went in to get their personal belongings into this crime scene. And then after that, they just started rolling one after another. I think by the time I left the FBI, 
our victim services response team had responded to more than 30 mass casualty events. Some where the FBI had the lead, many when we were in a support position. Boston Marathon bombing was another pivotal point for us because even though there were relatively few deceased, there were a lot of injured and it was just massive. It was a big case. We ended up rotating teams, people up there for a number of weeks. There were a lot of amputees, a lot of people with severe injuries, most of them not from the Boston area, particularly the runners. There was a deceased victim from Japan or China. There were other people. We ended up setting up a little mini travel agency. We were paying for family members to fly in to take care of their medically injured family members. We paid for medical transport for some of those victims once they were released from the hospital to go back home. A lot of different things. The personal effects became overwhelming. The crime scene was huge. They blocked off blocks and blocks of the city of Boston. And then the events that came afterwards with the capture of one of the perpetrators in Watertown, where the town was shut down again, also created some issues. The buildings where the bombings occurred, a lot of them were damaged. Those folks had been evacuated and were in hotels or staying with friends. I remember one of our people calling me and saying that she had went into the building with an agent to help look for somebody's pets and ended up, she found the pet and drove it out to where the victim whose home had been destroyed was. You never know what you're going to do, but it became sort of overwhelming, particularly the number of personal effects. When we were doing our after action for the Boston Marathon bombing response, it was clear that we needed to expand the team and that we needed to not just have victim specialists. We needed the victim specialists and the child interview specialists and those people to be able to work directly with the victims, going to the hospitals, working with families of the deceased, providing that support for them. And we needed other people who could handle the personal effects, who could put together a victim list. It becomes a really major task to put together an accurate and comprehensive list of who the victims are. And that is the responsibility primarily of the investigative agency. Under federal law, if it's the FBI's case, FBI is responsible for identifying the victims and building a list. In other cases, like Las Vegas, which I'll talk about in a minute, we actually ended up taking on that for the locals to build that victim list. We ended up canvassing across the FBI. We got over 900 applications, ended up with about 82 people that were selected. So we expanded the team from victim specialists and VSD staff to include agents, ERT folks, analysts, information specialists. We had all of those folks who could perform different functions. Now, when you said applications, you mean internally? Internal applications. We made people apply and put them through an interview process so we knew they would be the right folks to work. Because an agent or an ERT or an analyst going out, um, one of these responses is part of VSRT, the Victim Services Response Team, would not be functioning in their investigative capacity. They would be working as part of the Victim Services Team. And we had some great people. There's some great people involved. I remember after the Mother Emanuel shooting, church shooting in Charleston, hearing from the team and some of the agents that were doing the PE stuff, personal effects. That's what the ERT folks mainly work on. Some of the families of the victims had been looking for things that belonged to their loved ones, like Bibles. They'd been at a Bible study in the church, and there were precious items to these families. The agents found out that the police, when they had done the cleanup, had just thrown them all away. All the stuff that was had blood or anything else on it was just put in a dumpster. So our ERT agents got in the dumpster, started climbing through in their hazmat stuff, found all of these items, particularly some of these family Bibles, and we sent them to a vendor that we had identified in Texas who we used a lot. They had the ability to preserve documents and to decontaminate and clean every single page if they had to of a Bible or a book or whatever so that it could be safely and sensitively presented back to a family member. In this type of situation, what a relief to a family member to get that family Bible back, that piece of their family member that was no longer with them. And, you know, personal effects have a lot of meaning. They tell stories about a victim's life, part of that story. And there's a story almost attached to, to most things, except maybe car keys. It's important to acknowledge that and respect it and try to help recover those things for people. They take on a meaning beyond their physical value. They become sometimes a representation of that life that was lost. It's really important to do. The other thing that we started doing with this team, like I said, we expanded it and we had them regionalized. So they would respond to different events based sort of regionally. And then sometimes we just had to cross regions with them. 
When we set up the victim services response team, the expanded team, we broke them out into regional teams. They would tend to respond to an event in their region, but there were times when we had to use multiple teams or have some crossover. We tried to tailor our response in the team that was responding to the incident and the population of victims. For instance, the sick temple shooting in Wisconsin. We didn't have a full response to that. We didn't send a full team, but we had a lot of people there. We worked with the FBI to have an agent who was of the Sikh faith, who was part of the team and involved, and also identified a couple of Punjabi speakers who could come in so that our response was culturally appropriate and welcomed by the victim population, not just the families of the deceased, but the others. Pulse nightclub shooting, I became clear very quickly that the LGBTQ community in that area did not have a great relationship. There's not a lot of trust with law enforcement. So our folks, when they got down there, had a little bit of a hard time sort of breaking into that. We ended up asking members of the director's advisory committee on LGBTQ employees and issues if they had some folks that would be willing to respond with our team. So they did. They went down and they were great. They went to the community center. They built those bridges that opened the doors for those folks who were affected to come in who felt sort of alienated from the justice process. That was very helpful. Those team members from the LGBTQ Advisory Committee also worked with the agents and with our folks to help us understand some of the issues that some of these victims were facing and help navigate some of those. In many cases, you had a deceased victim who was estranged from their birth family but had a longtime partner. And it created some interesting dynamics if that person, the victim, had not had a will per se, or something. That became very helpful. The Tree of Life synagogue shooting, which the case is just wrapped up in Pittsburgh, it was very clearly a Jewish community. The incident team leader for the victim services response team was someone of Jewish background, and that helped. Instead of creating a traditional sort of family assistance center where the families of victims and the survivors go for information and help, the victim specialists and the others went to their homes because families were sitting shiva. They were at home following their own religious traditions. I think the fact that the FBI is willing to tailor the response to the individuals and their needs at the time and their cultural needs and their personal needs become even more important in the face of a tragedy like that. I think those things are very appreciated when we could do that. Las Vegas, I will never forget getting a call from the deputy director in the middle of the night saying, turn on your TV. There's been a shooting at the Harvest Festival in Las Vegas. It was massive. There were so many people who were impacted, large number of deceased victims, injured victims, people who ran for their lives, who were traumatized by it. The response also had to be fairly massive. We sent a big team out there. We actually had multiple teams rotate over time. One of the things that we did was coordinate immediately with all of the local providers, local people. One of the things that was very clear is that the vast majority of people at that concert were not from Las Vegas. Many were not even from Nevada. They were from other countries as well as across the United States. So they created some issues. We immediately set up the capacity as we usually did to help fund emergency travel and lodging for family members that needed to come in. We did a number of medevacs for injured victims to go back. We helped set up a family assistance center. We also had teams go to the hospital where victims were hospitalized. Our team I didn't mention this before, but in 2014, we added two dogs to the team, two crisis response canines, facility dogs. Some people would call them therapy dogs. These were two labs that were specially trained to work with people who've experienced trauma, not just one person, but multiple people. And they're pretty amazing. They can walk into a room full of traumatized people and go to the right person who needs the most and do the thing that they need doing. It's a really great capacity and a really important thing. I know the victim services coordinators would take the dogs to the hospital. There was a police officer that was there at the concert who'd been injured pretty badly. And I think, I can't remember whether it was Wally or Geo, but went to visit this guy in the hospital multiple times. One of the first things he responded to was the dog who was sitting on a chair beside his bed. The dog put his head on the victim's arm and the victim was able to start reacting to it. The dog went back for a number of days to provide support. The other thing in Vegas that we had to do that was quite challenging was just the number of personal effects because people ran. There were 20,000 people, whatever, at that concert. There was everything from stuff that belonged to the vendors to people who were there. They left behind purses, 
strollers, chairs, clothing. People lost their shoes when they were running, all kinds of things. The FBI ended up taking over the scene and processing it, which was huge. What they did, they divided the scene into grids. Our ERT folks from the Victim Services Response Team coordinated with them, and they mapped out the personal effects where they were found. They got a big map of the scene, put it in the Family Assistance Center, and asked people who were looking for items, personal effects, to identify where in the crowd, where on the scene they were sitting. And then the personal effects taken from that particular area were housed in an area of the Family Assistance Center that could only be accessed by FBI personnel, but it was housed according to the sector that they were found in. Some items could be pretty quickly identified and returned. Others were contaminated by blood or uh, and human body fluids and had to be decontaminated and cleaned before they could be returned. There were a large number of items that were unassociated, couldn't be associated to anyone. I remember Paul telling me, like 10,000 black flip-flops, thousands of lawn chairs. At some point, we had to draw a line and say, we do not have the resources to figure out and return who all these lawn chairs belong to and all of these black flip-flops that all look alike, except they're different sizes. Within the realm of possible, we returned everything that we could that was really important and of value to people. Things like the lawn chairs and the flip-flops that were sort of de minimis value, we ended up working with the locals to dispose of. One of the agents that was on the ERT for the Victim Services Response Team was responsible for returning a handbag to a Canadian woman who had been at the concert with her husband. She had gone back to Canada. He found her bag. She claimed it using a form. I found the bag. When he was looking to find out if it had her identification in it, he found that she had had some winnings at the casino but had not cashed them in. So he took the purse and the winnings to that casino, was able as an FBI agent to say, the victim, can we cash these in for her? They did. He put the money in the purse and then had the purse messengered to her in Canada. A Canadian television actually had a story on this because this woman was so amazed. First, that she could get her handbag back after the tens of thousands of items that were left at that scene. And two, that the agent would take the time to get her winnings and include them in her purse and send them back to her. Those are some of the things, millions of stories like that. I did a case review on the recovery of those type of items in Las Vegas with Mm -hmm. retired agent Rod Swanson, and that's episode 226. And I'll link that also to the show notes for this episode, because Rod really goes through what he was able to do as Mm -hmm. a retired agent to assist victim services. I think that really gives some detail into the work that your yeah, team did. Yeah, it was very helpful. And like I said, Vegas was such a huge event. There were so many moving parts to it. In addition, so there are all these mass casualty crimes that occur in the United States that the VSRT may respond to. As I said, they've become a pretty important asset of the FBI. I know going to IECP and some other major chiefs conferences where some of the chiefs have spoken about the events that have happened in their community, and they all mention how valuable it was to have the FBI victim services people there and what they were able to do because their folks, if they had them, were overwhelmed. And when you think about these events and you have victim services folks who go to the scene, they help set up a reception center, they're there helping to do death notification, they're trying to help families. It's exhausting. And they're they're exhausted after the first 24, 36 hours. You have to have an, an ability to multiply the force working. And I think that's one of the things that the FBI brings of value, as well as just a unique level of experience in dealing with these mass casualty events. Most communities may have one in a 10 or 15 year period. It really is helpful to have people come in who can be those force multipliers and also do a little guidance and have you thought about doing this and, and things like that. It's very important to do. And as I said, this this shame now is that these events are coming so quickly. It's hard to have the resources to respond to as many of them as probably need the additional help. The good thing is that more communities have become aware of the fact that they need to organize. They need to have the ability in their own community or state to have to have an effective response to a mass casualty. So one of the other things that VSD does is when there are mass casualties overseas, that are affecting Americans. Almost every event that's happened in Europe or a lot of other places in the last 20 years has involved multinational victims. There's almost always some Americans involved in other countries as well. Even in New York, the Tribeca truck attack, of the eight deceased victims, six were foreign tourists. The ability to work with the consulates, with the embassies, our legats to 
coordinate with those governments, with their families in those countries, and things become very important. Over the years, when I was there and my section chief and others, we really began to get to know people in other countries, Canadians, Irish, French, Swiss, German, the UK, and who the folks were that were responding to these things. And we started doing conferences together and formed an informal network that still meets by phone regularly once a month just to share information, training, resources. When something happens where there are multinational victims, we can coordinate with each other. Or they can. I keep saying we, but it's them. They have to do it these days. But it's helpful to have those kinds of connections and resources. I think one of the other things that the Victim Services Division has addressed or been a part of addressing in recent years has been the hostage situations, which tend to wax and wane. For a few years, you'll have a large number of hostage takings overseas from terrorists, pirates in some cases, and then they'll sort of wane for a while, and then the next group will come up and they'll start taking more hostages. We had gone through that with Al-Qaeda, with Danny Pearl. Nick Berg, other contractors who were abducted, often murdered, some beheaded, which was something I had never really seen or dealt with before. And that adds a particular level of horror for the families of those victims. Al-Qaeda, I think, finally learned that they weren't winning points, even among their own supporters, by beheading people. It slowed down for a while, and then ISIS came into effect and started taking people and brutally murdering them. We were involved in working with some of the ISIS families our office was. It was complicated. There were a lot of agencies involved. I will be honest, and I think other people know this too, the agencies weren't always on the same page. There was some infighting. There were some disagreements. There were agencies who had no jurisdiction who were threatening to prosecute families if they tried to negotiate or pay ransom. That was not the FBI or DOJ, by the way, saying that because they've never prosecuted a family for that. But it just added to the craziness and the angst for the families to see that their government wasn't operating with one voice. My office, we had people assign victim services coordinators who worked with terrorism cases to those families, trying to keep them informed, trying to provide assistance and services. A lot of it's information. It's helping them try to understand what's going on, getting information to them as soon as possible. And that's really hard to do in a day and age where even terrorists are doing social media and putting stuff out before even government agencies can deal with it. I will never forget sitting in the FBI late one night when I knew they were attempting the U.S. government a rescue of the ISIS hostages. The deputy director called me and said it was a dry hole. We missed them, but not by much. After that, it was sort of waiting on tenor hooks to see what was going to happen. When the first video, the beheading of Jim Foley, the journalist Jim Foley, came out, I can't tell you how devastating that was. It was beyond devastating for his family and the families of the other hostages. But for those of us who had been involved in working with them, it was just unimaginable that we had come to that point. After that, it was just waiting for the next one, Stephen Sotloff. A month or so after that, it was Peter Kassig and then Kayla Mueller. None of their bodies have been recovered, and those families went through a great deal. Ultimately, in late 2014, the White House decided to do a hostage policy review team. The deputy director, Mark Giuliano at the time, insisted that they include somebody on victim issues, so he sort of shoved me out in front to do that. The team was led by NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center, General Sokolik, who did a wonderful job herding a bunch of <laughs> herding cats, a bunch of different agencies that didn't always agree on stuff. I ended up heading the family engagement team, which is probably one of the more productive teams. We could really come to agreement pretty quickly about what we needed to do for families of hostages and recovered hostages. We ended up making recommendations. We met with families of hostages. General Sokolik interviewed many of them and came up with his own report. Went back to the White House, and then we were tasked with putting together a new policy directive for the U.S. government on hostages that included a very robust section on family engagement and support. We stood up a hostage recovery fusion cell, interagency cell in the FBI who hosted it. It was led by an FBI person, but there were deputies from state and Department of Defense, a lot of different agencies in the same room. They are talking about the same cases every day, sharing information, coming up with perhaps investigative strategies or diplomatic strategies, whatever they could do. And then there was a family engagement coordinator in a team that involved FBI and State Department consular personnel who would support the families. 
It was a painful lesson to learn when what we did learn was that when you work with these families, particularly if it's an overseas terrorist case, when these overseas hostages cases happen, it's so important to get to the families very quickly. Most families have had little contact with law, particularly federal law enforcement and the federal government on this end, other than paying taxes and getting Social Security. So just trying to navigate what the U.S. government is doing and who's doing what is difficult. Understanding the environment in which their loved one is being held, understanding something about the terrorist group or whoever is holding them, and then helping them cope with that because often the news isn't good, particularly if they've had a history of taking and killing other hostages. And then it's just trying to keep them informed, providing support so that have somebody in the hostage fusion cell and then they'll have a local victim specialist and a local agent that's also sort of involved on the front end with them who could be at their home very quickly and provide some additional support. So keeping them informed and letting them know as much as possible what we know that's coming in that can be shared with them. But also the most important thing is making sure that those families can believe that their government is doing everything possible to try to recover their loved ones. Because the families themselves need to know that they're doing everything possible to recover their loved one. If the hostage is killed, they really need to know that, and they need to try to understand that we as a government have done everything possible to try to recover their loved ones safely. So we've seen it all. There were some joyful reunions when Jess Buchanan was recovered. That was amazing. It was amazing to be there, to be there when the president called her husband and father to tell them that she had been recovered alive along with another hostage from another country. And then those real lows when the hostages were killed, either by the hostage takers or during a rescue attempt, which did happen. Those cases are like roller coaster rides for everybody involved. And as one hostage family told me, it's not just a roller coaster ride. Sometimes it just turns into a free fall. Being able to manage that and being able to support those families through all of that and doing your best, because whatever the outcome, they need to know that we've done our best. And what makes those cases different and the other situations that we've talked about, the trauma event Mm -hmm. has happened and now you're dealing with the aftermath. But in these hostage situations, it's ongoing. It is ongoing. And one of the things that I learned from working with families of kidnapped children and other long-term kidnapped victims that helped in preparing for some of these hostage families is that when someone like Jim Foley or Stephen Saloff or Peter or Taylor are killed, their families have to deal with not just their death and how they died and often not getting a body back, but what they endured in the time they were held. We know from some of the hostages from other countries that were ransomed out what happened to some of them and how they were treated. That is something that becomes part of that whole experience and the grief and the sense of just horror that this is what my loved one went through for a year and a half, two years before they were finally killed. It's hard. And for most of those families, particularly when there's a video, most of them don't watch it. Some do. I've seen a few and never want to see another one again. I don't know why anybody would want to gratuitously watch them because it's an insult to the families and the victims as well, I think. It just takes everything to a whole new level. My heart still goes out to families who have to face that and live with it for the rest of their lives. When we first started talking about victim services and victim specialists, I think everyone, including me, thought we knew what you did and what services you provided. But it's amazing. When you first started the unit, had you any idea that it was going to, in your almost 20 years with the FBI, that it would grow to this point? You basically took what at the time was happening at DOJ, at the Department of Justice, and brought it over to the FBI. Is there still a program? There's still the Office for Victims of Crime at DOJ, and you know, the U.S. Attorney's offices have victim witness coordinators. It's a little bit different because they're reaching victims at different points in the process. Well, I never imagined in my entire life that I would work for the FBI because I never was an agent or wanted to be. I have a great deal of respect for them and very fun, but it just wasn't something I'd ever considered in my life. Ending up there was a huge honor, but kind of a surprise. I was surprised at how quickly we could grow, how much we were able to do. As I said, we had great support from Director Mueller and later just as the program became more institutionalized, thanks to the incredible professional work of the victim specialists and the other people who were working on the front lines with victims, more respected and more accepted in the FBI. When I first got there, I had a three-year plan. 
Then I had another three-year plan. Then I had a five-year plan. And then it just kept going. As I said, we responded to what the needs were. We responded to where the federal crimes the FBI investigating went, whether it was cyber crimes involving children or identity theft or terrorism or whatever. We just tried to adapt and build resources to help victims of those crimes. I'm very proud of the people that I worked with. It's an amazing, amazing people. And I worried about them all the time because you can't do this work and not be affected by it. And I think we hire some really special people who are pretty resilient. My approach to working with victims of trauma was instead of wringing my hands and just feeling sorry and sad about it, I'm in the position of being able to do something. I actually have tools, I have money, I have practical things that I can do to help folks with this. So I think a lot of the people in the program sort of take that approach. That said, it takes a toll after a number of years and their jobs have a shelf life for most people. And at some point, it's healthy for them to move on. We also tried to put into place mental health resources, respite resources, other things for victim specialists who needed to take a break. If we needed to, we would send in another victim specialist to take over while they took some time off. Well, I know that for agents who work crimes against children, that they do have some type Mm -hmm. of psychological testing or just to make sure they're okay. Do they also have that for victim specialists? I don't know what they have. We, We experimented with different things. At one point, I was told that the only way to make sure that our victim specialists and other employees who are working directly with victims had access to mental health care without it jeopardizing their security clearance was if it was mandatory. And I don't know that that's true. I had different things over the years. I think there are some people who will seek help on their own. There are others who won't do it on their own and who need it probably the most. It's a hard balance to strike to make the resources available in a way that's not threatening to them and that's protecting them. And that was what we tried to do in several instances as we explored different options working with EAP or different folks was to make it so that it was safe that they could get help. It could be anonymous, confidential. We didn't need to know. We would pay for things, but we didn't need to know what was going on between that victim service provider, victim specialist, and the therapist. We just wanted them to get help one way or the other, and however it needed to be done so that it wouldn't raise red flags with the security division. There's still a lack of understanding, I think, and an acceptance of the fact that these jobs, whether you're an agent dealing with crimes against children, you're an agent dealing with terrorism cases, whatever, victim specialists, looking, seeing the kind of trauma that people experience firsthand, being on crime scenes, doing the work that they do. You can separate yourself emotionally at the time, but it does have an impact. I always felt very strongly for the FBI, we put people in those positions. It's part of their jobs but we expose them to those things. They have a duty to perform, but as an agency, the FBI has a duty to care and to take care of people when we expose them to terrible things. And we should not make it difficult. We should not make it so that it jeopardizes even the perception that it jeopardizes their employment. That's kind of my soapbox, but I feel very strongly about it because I saw it. I felt it myself. The things that I experienced and saw and did, it never felt that I could really, if I needed to, get the help that I needed or take medication for depression or whatever. That's still kind of out there. Hopefully the bureaus move beyond that. They're getting better at it. They're more open and welcoming and supportive of getting people the mental health support that they need. But I don't know. In law enforcement, it's hard. Especially if they're afraid for their job. Yes, it is. And it's a hard balance to strike to make the resources available. Yeah. And I think that's the point, not just for the FBI, but for law enforcement in general, especially Mm -hmm. in the atmosphere today, to have that type of support is crucial to not just the work that's being done and the reaction and the response, but of the mental health of the law enforcement personnel, including all the uh, support and professional people. If somebody was injured in the line of duty, physically injured, they would get workers' comp. They would go to a doctor. They would get medical care. They'd use their insurance or whatever, but they would get the care that they needed, and their supervisors in their office would want them to do that. The psychic injury is also another issue that should be treated the same way. I don't know that it ever will, but we can get closer, I think, to that. I would also recognize the value of peer support. 
because nobody understands it better than the guy in the next foxhole who's dealing with the same issues or the same victim specialist who's dealing with the horrible cases. The ability for them to provide some support to each other is also an important thing to facilitate within the, the work environment. Beautifully said. Before we go on and talk a little bit about what you're doing now and, and things like that, I would love to talk again about the qualifications of somebody who is interested in applying for one of these positions with the FBI. Can you go over that again? Well, positions have different requirements based on what the functions of the job are. But for the victim specialist positions, I believe if it's still, like I said, I've been out for three years, but it's still, I think, a minimum of a bachelor's degree in a social and behavioral science. There are a number of them. And then I think a minimum of three years experience working with victims of violent crime. And people can come at that from different ways, from having been, like I said, child protective services, working in domestic violence shelter, working in rape crisis. There are a lot of different ways that experience can be garnered. And somebody, look for people who can meet victims where they are, provide the information and support they need, and also make the right connections for them in the community for the external support services. And they also really need to be able to work as a team with law enforcement, with agents. It's a different environment. If you're coming as a therapist from therapeutic treatment center, it can be a little more difficult if you're not used to working in a law enforcement environment. People that can adapt to that, well, that's primarily what they're looking for. There are other jobs, like I said, within Victim Services Division that are administrative or financial that are different, have different requirements. But the important thing is wherever you are in that process and wherever somebody is in the Victim Services Division, whether they're processing credit card transactions or filling out a budget request or helping to hire or doing logistics, they are an important integral part of that whole machine, that whole mechanism of supporting victims in crimes that are handled by the FBI. So everybody has an important role to play. And sometimes getting that contract processed or getting an emergency thing purchased is really crucial. When I was there, I always tried to send a note to the person, even maybe if they were in the finance division, saying, hey, do you know that what you did made this difference? It's helpful for people to understand that wherever they fit into it. I will also have a link in the show notes. This is going to be packed with different links and resources. Mm -hmm to fbi.gov and the victim services careers and the victim specialist requirements and everything that has to do with the position so that anybody who is really interested can just go to the show notes and click on that and get the most up-to-date information on the requirements and if there's any open positions in the FBI today. There usually are some. So I know some of the people that I hired when I first got there, some of the victim specialists, they're reaching points where they're retiring. They're at that point. Some have already retired and some planning on it soon. So we always need that pipeline filled of victim service providers. We're at the point in the episode where I ask when and why you joined the FBI. Now, we've already talked Mm -hmm. about how you got into the FBI. What made you decide you even wanted to be involved in victim services? I always wanted to be in a position of helping people. And that sounds very naive. But when I graduated from college, I've said this before, my roommate and I were talking about our lives after graduation. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. She was going to be a special ed teacher. I said, you know, whatever it is, I want my life to be something more than just long. I want to be able to do something that has real purpose and meaning. After floundering around for a few years through volunteer work, I found what I really loved and got the most satisfaction out of. And then working on the Hill, and then when the senator died, ending up in the Justice Department and doing crime victims issues, I just found to be a wonderful career. Hard, but really great, and lots of opportunities to do good and to try to make things better for people who are in a really bad situation. When the opportunity came to go to the FBI, I was delighted. It was a little daunting because the mission, as Director Mueller laid it out for me, was pretty big. I loved it. I loved it. Even the hardest days, even the days when people made me crazy with bureaucratic stuff, I still loved it. It was a privilege. It was an honor to work with the people I did and to work with victims. The FBI gets a bad rap, and every agency has their mistakes, 
bad apples, whatever you want to call it. But overall, it's such an amazing agency with such amazing people. And I hope they can stand strong and stay proud of what they do and the mission that they serve for the United States and people who will probably never understand or recognize what their contributions really are. I loved it. It was a sad day when I left, but it was time. I was tired and ready for younger people to start coming in and taking over some things. Well, you retired then in 2020? Yeah, the end of June. I was going to retire the end of December that year. And then the director asked me to stay another six months. So I did. And of course, COVID hit. So that made everything really interesting. But I retired and left an area I loved, Northern Virginia. I'd lived there for 30-something years and moved down to the Nashville area because I wanted to be closer to where my scattered family is and within driving distance and where there's a decent airport. But I didn't want to live where any of them live because they're in places like Red Oak, Iowa, which isn't bad, but it's just not where I want to live. The nearest target's like 50 minutes away. I've settled into a little town just south of Nashville and making friends, doing some volunteer work. Years ago, when I joined the Justice Department, the first program I ran, the Missing Children's Program, we helped support CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates for Abused Children. I also did that when I was at OVC. We supported expansion of CASA programs across the country. I signed up here. I am a Court Appointed Special Advocate in the court system here. That means a judge. Every time there's a child abuse or a child at risk in the court, the judge will appoint a CASA to work as an independent sort of neutral party to ensure the best interest of the child. I have several open cases right now, and I visit the kids every month, at least, making sure that these kids have support, that their parents have what they need, or if they're in foster care, that they have what they need. And ultimately, the judge has the information to help make the best decision for what's going to happen with that child's future. I also volunteer with the local African-American Heritage Society here. I met some really interesting people. We have a book club and help do some events, build new houses in this one community. It's a historic black community. There are days when we go over and we'll do landscaping or clean up and help the people who live in that community. I enjoy doing those things and looking after my mother who's in assisted living here now. It took a while to stop looking for my FBI phone. I always kept it with me wherever I went. After a while, I got used to not having it, and I'm enjoying being retired. Excellent. I like to give my guest the last word. So what would you like to say? One of the things I would like people to realize and remember that for every crime that you see on the news or on Netflix where they've fictionalized or done some documentary on something, there are victims and families there that bear the real cost and the real impact of these crimes long after, like I said, long after those of us who worked with them are on to the next case. I think it's just important that we try to help the rest of the world. Those of us who are in the system, who work with victims, who work with crime, know that and understand it. But I think it's important that we carry that kind of into the world as well. I just see so much in the news and see so many things where terrible crimes are sort of sensationalized online, whether it's in social media. There's so much misinformation, disinformation about crimes. There's documentaries that sometimes are gratuitous in what they show or not fair in what they show. Those things just sort of pour salt into the wounds of those victims and families. I think it's really important for all of us to be responsible and to try to remember who the people are who have to carry the burden of these crimes forward and provide as much support and understanding as possible and education to the community around us. And that's the end of the interview. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a direct link to jerrywilliams.com and the show notes, where you'll find a photo of Catherine Terman, photos and links to articles about the FBI's Victim Services Division, information of the qualifications for the specialist position, including an infographic of victim services stats and an adorable photo and video featuring Wally and Geo, the FBI's crisis response dog. There's also links to FBI Retired Case File Review, Episode 47, about the bombing of Flight 103, Episode 226, about the victim services response to the Las Vegas mass shooting, and Episode 240, about the 9-11 recovery operation and how the FBI responds to mass casualties. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. 
You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode, or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.